Welcome to today's uh, lecture. Um, today's lecture is, as all the lectures organized by the Department of Philosophy, uh, Faculty of Arts, University of Ljubljana, and uh, Slovenia Research Agency Finance Project, uh, Hegel's Political Metaphysics. And it is today my honor to welcome our guest, uh, Dr. Professor Dean Moyer, uh, professor at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University in Baltimore, he has written or published extensively on classical German uh, philosophy, especially Hegel, and uh, his books, the most recent ones, are Hegel's Value, Justice as the Living Good, and the other one is Hegel's Conscience. Both, both books are worth reading, uh, but currently, something completely different. He is uh, editing a volume on Moby Dick for the Oxford Studies uh, in Philosophy and Literature series. So that was, will be something completely different, but I think that's also worth reading. But today, a more classical topic will be his lecture titled, Can the Rational Will Be Evil? So without further ado, I'm leaving myself out of it and leaving your, the word. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, this is my first time in Ljubljana, but I've learned that I already had a strong connection to Slovenia since I spent the first 18 years of my life in Cleveland, Ohio, second only to Trieste in Slovenian population some 100 years ago. So it's great to be here and to be able to talk to you about the rational will. I hope you all have a handout. I'm going to read this paper and um, hope it will be under an hour. Evil deeds are a familiar part of human life. Yet we struggle to make sense of evil as the activity of a rational being. This is a variant of the problem that Plato addressed in the thesis that no one ever does bad actions willingly. If we judge rationally, and we only employ our will when we follow our judgment, we are not really ourselves when we perform evil deeds. This issue became especially pressing for the classical German philosophers who defined the rational will in terms of freedom or autonomy. Immanuel Kant had to modify his original claim that only the moral will is free, for that left him no way to account for our responsibility for evil deeds. J.G. Fichte's idealism appears to follow Plato's line more closely, appearing to deny outright the possibility of a consciously evil will. G.W.F. Hegel opens the door to the self-conscious evil will by aligning evil with the general human capacity for interiority and subjective freedom. I argue that his ability to account for the phenomenon counts in favor of his revolutionary view of rationality, but that it also heralds a crisis for the modern subject. His view tends towards a deflationary account of evil, yet he also shows how modern life tends to place the individual in a position in which they are unable to see their own misdeeds and hypocrisy. So my first quote on the handout comes from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. As you've just heard, I'm working on a project on Moby Dick, which is a novel that is, among other things, about the crisis of the subject. He expresses in his tragic comic mode one of the main strands of my paper. So, the permanent constitutional condition of the manufactured man, thought Ahab, is sordidness. Ahab is, of course, the maniacal captain of the Pequod who's taking his crew on a quest to kill Moby Dick. Granting that the white whale fully incites the hearts of this my savage crew, and playing round their savageness even breeds a certain generous knight errantism in them. Still, while the love of it they while well, for the love of it they give chase to Moby Dick, they must also have food for their more common daily appetites. For even the high lifted and chivalric crusaders of old times were not content to traverse two thousand miles of land to fight for their holy sepulchre, without committing burglaries, picking pockets, and gaining other pious perquisites by the way. Had they been strictly held to their one final and romantic object, 
that final and romantic object too many would have turned from in disgust. I will not strip these men, thought Ahab, of all hopes of cash. I cash. They may scorn cash now, but let some months go by and no prospective promise of it to them, and then the same quiescent cash all at once mutinying in them, the same cash would soon cashier Ahab. I learned uh, on Monday, among other things, that I saw the arch in Trieste that Richard the Lionhearted may have passed under on his way to the uh, Holy Lands. Somehow it all is, is coming together here. Um, so one way to formulate our question, reformulate our question, is the will of a free and rational will only in pursuit of the good? That's the question. But when asked in terms of the good, and not in terms of evil, the obvious question is, which good? Are we talking about the good of high and noble purposes? Or are we talking about the ordinary good of our interests? If it's just the good, then the thesis seems outlandish or overly idealistic. If it's any good, then it doesn't seem that interesting, for it just means that the will is the pursuit of ends, and we have to take some sort of interest in our ends for them to be ours. But evil, in the specifically post-Christian context of classical German philosophy, tends to be figured as the pursuit of self-interest overdoing one's duty for duty's sake. Thus Kant and Fichte both think of morality and morally worthy actions in terms of a universal law. But does that mean we can only pursue universal ends to the exclusion of our particular interest and attachments? If so, we must be under suspicion of evil all the time, and most of our actions might not be our own because not done for the selfless action of the goodwill for the duty for duty's sake. The account in Hegel that I'll draw out gives a prominent role to particular interests and insists that one can pursue both subjective and objective ends simultaneously. In the end, he puts the burden on social conditions and institutions, and I'm sympathetic to this view, but I worry that we may be lacking in the resources to criticize the tendency of those institutions to promote greed and power if we have already deflated the concept of evil. Okay, section one, the impossibility of conscious willing against the law, where I set up the issues for Hegel in terms of the problems in Fichte's account. So the problem of this paper, again, can be described in terms of a thesis of internalism about the will, namely the idea that rationality or rational judgment is internal to the will, so that a will without an essential connection to rationality is unthinkable. Evil is a problem for the internalist insofar as conscious willing of the evil is unintelligible given the essential rationality of the will. Clearly some account of evil must be given, and it cannot be the idea of a non-willing or non-agency, for then we could not say that individuals are responsible for evil. For contrasting proponents of externalism about the will, on the other hand, evil is simply evidence for their view. Externalists hold there to be no inherent link of willing and rationality, so one can simply choose to will evil even against one's better judgment of the good. So in Kant's hands, just to give you a brief statement of his position before moving on, um, in Kant's hands, the philosophy of agency becomes a philosophy of autonomy. I am an agent in the full sense only when I act on a law that I have given to myself. In this doctrine, the Socratic paradox of agency seems to be affirmed and even amplified. No one does the bad willingly because to do something willingly is to legislate to oneself freely, and that only takes place if one has truly legislated for a kingdom of ends. You do not really have a will if you are not acting according to the law, and thus we cannot ascribe action to you unless you are willing the good. That at least is Kant's story in the 1785 groundwork account of agency and freedom. But Kant was immediately confronted with the challenge that agency so conceived renders unintelligible our responsibility for bad actions, since bad actions are not free and thus do not seem to be imputable at all. Partly in response to this worry, he turned to a doctrine of choice a minimal sense of the voluntary to save the agent's responsibility for bad actions. This is a lesser form of free agency, which places the source of bad action in the subject 
while maintaining a concept of the will constituted by an orientation towards the moral law. He also put forward a strong thesis that all human beings have an innate tendency to radical evil. Simply put, we have a tendency to make self-love the maximum of our actions, prioritizing pleasure over duty. Now, while some people find this new view admirably honest about the will, others have been puzzled about his, how his two views of the will or his two views of agency actually fit together. The earlier view that we all know from learning Kant's moral philosophy is internalist, while this theory in the religion seems to be more externalist. How do they fit together? Because of these problems, contemporary Kantians have tended to stick to the earlier view and not really been able to accommodate the latter view. Now Fichte um, comes on the scene and revises the whole framework that Kant is working with, doesn't take the causality of the, law, of the moral law through the will to be the essential thing, and therefore he seems like he's in a position to be less bound to an internalist thesis. He holds that the I is purely self-active and that universality and the law are consequences of that pure self-activity. But Fichte puts almost as much weight on the maxim that must be in play for the action to be an instance of full-blooded agency as Kant did. Furthermore, his central argument for the operation of the moral law in the empirical human being links moral willing to an infallible belief, conscience, that this specific action here and now is the right action. So I've given you this quote because uh, we need to know a little bit about conscience as the background to evil because that's the place where Hegel takes off from. So this is number two on the handout. There is therefore absolutely no external ground nor external criterion for the binding force of an ethical command. A command is binding only on the condition that it is confirmed by our own conscience and only because it has been confirmed in this way. As a corollary to this, he says, nobody can judge the morality of another person. It's an inner criterion. Now Fichte claims to be following Kant with his doctrine of conscience, but Fichte's account differs considerably from what Kant says about conscience in the religion and elsewhere, whereas Kant mainly employs his consciousness of duty to keep one from acting on uncertain claims. Fichte makes it a positive criterion of action and thus seems to say that we can and must know our action as the right one and know our feeling as correct. So there's a way in which this seems counter to Kant's famous opacity thesis, according to which we can never know what our actual motives are. Fichte describes conscience in terms of a complete certainty and so gives the distinct impression that the quality of moral feeling is accessible to consciousness. This is the whole point of it as an absolute criterion. And this raises the first question that he takes to be the first sort of issue around internalism that I'm gonna thematize, namely the issue of isolation, which is the thesis that one must be able to isolate the determining grounds of the will such that one acts only when one has identified that one is acting for the sake of the moral law, right? This was there in Kant, but Kant says, of course, we can never really know why we're doing it. Fichte says things like, well, actually, this is an infallible feeling that, is, that can never go wrong, and therefore he seems to say we have some sort of access to it. This thesis is problematic given that Fichte shares with Kant some version of the claim that the will is inexplicable when we don't do the right thing. And so it can seem like he has to have an inner criterion for evil action too, but that would be very weird. As we'll see in a moment, Fichte does write about cases of self-deception, so it's not like he thinks that we are an open book to ourselves. But he does raise the disturbing possibility that only the agent themselves is in a position to know whether or not they are evil. For our question about the rational will, this view is rather destabilizing, as, as Hegel will point out. Now I want to say a tiny bit more about his view of conscience, which is more complex than I've made it out to be. It has a <clears throat> two-part view where the first part is uh, reflective judgment on the epistemic features of the case. And then once you've gone through all those judgments, conscience as this inner criterion says, oh yeah, that's the right one. And so when you've said that's the right one, your conscience affirms it as your duty, your will is already involved 
in the judgment that this action in front of you is in fact binding on you. So when I've willed the thorough process of ethical examination and I've arrived at an action that's my duty, my conscience signals its assent as a feeling of certainty that this action is what I am committed to. And so Fichte denies that there's a gap between conscience and action if everything has gone correctly. He thus holds that to will the opposite of conscience's edict is impossible, absurd, incoherent, and he thus endorses a strong internalist thesis and rejects the idea of consciously willing evil. So this brings me to passage three, which is really the passage in Fichte that um, made me think about using his view as a starting point for Hegel's. He says, it is absolutely impossible and contradictory that anyone with a clear consciousness of his duty at the moment he acts could, with good consciousness, decide not to do his duty, that he should rebel against the law, refusing to obey it and making it his maxim not to do his duty because it is his duty. Such a maxim would be diabolical, but the concept of the devil is self-contradictory and therefore annuls itself. We can prove this as follows. To say that a human being is clearly aware of his duty means that he, as an intellect, absolutely demands of himself that he do something. To say that he decides to act with good consciousness contrary to his duty means that, at the same undivided moment, he demands of himself that he not do the very same thing. At one and the same moment, therefore, these contradictory demands will be placed upon him by one and the same power, a presupposition that annuls itself and involves the clearest and most patent contradiction. So the use of contradiction here gives us important clues as to how Fichte is eliminating the possibility of a diabolical and even an indifferent will. Willing, Fichte claims that a decision to act must be a willing for the sake of duty if it is to count as a decision of conscience. So clear consciousness here is not just any old judgment or belief but a consciousness that brings the will or a demand along with it. So it would seem that Fichte's answer to our question is no, the rational will cannot be evil because it would be diabolical and a diabolical will is self-contradictory. Fichte is assuming here that moral judgment is intrinsically motivating and so he's endorsing a strong internalism. And in this claim about the contradictoriness of the diabolical will, Fichte is making a strong claim about the intelligibility of the will and the unintelligibility of the willing of evil. So I mentioned isolation, now we have intelligibility as another thesis that I wanna keep on the table. There are to be sure degrees of the thesis so that one can admit that certain kinds of evil willing are intelligible while denying that the diabolical will is intelligible. The question <clears throat> that Fichte do does have to confront and tries to address in his text, The System of Ethics, is how to think of the will of a being who's not moral. It's not like you can just say, well, those cases are desire taking over and so we're not gonna deal with them. He tries to give some account of the uh, phenomenology of, of counter-normative conduct and he considers someone whose maxim is the pursuit of their own happiness and he considers such a being evil even though they are stuck at this phase where that's all that they can think of as the end of their life happiness. He considers them evil because they are capable. He thinks we're always capable of raising ourselves to a higher standpoint, but they have not done so. They are radically evil by nature, he says, trying to accommodate his view to Kant, because this is a natural state that they may be destined to remain in without the proper impetus to something higher. Now, what is interesting for me is what he says about the next stage of the development of the will. He has this pursuit of happiness, Second stage, fourth stage is when you realize your moral calling to will freedom for the sake of freedom. And then there's this in-between stage where one is conscious of the will's dominion over everything but has not yet reflected on the drive and thus has not become moral. This is uh, passage number four. The previously established maxim of self-interest remains in force as a maxim in this state as well. This maxim is always followed whenever one acts with consciousness of an end. In terms of the matter or content of willing, what arises from the preceding is the maxim of unrestricted and lawless dominion over everything outside of us. A maxim which, to be sure, is not clearly thought, but which offers to an observer who occupies a higher standpoint 
the only ground for explaining such a way of act acting. It is not that the human being intends to bring everything outside of him under the absolute sway of his will. He does not intend anything at all, but is only driven blindly. But he acts as though he had this intention, and he does so for absolutely no other reason than because he wills to do it. Um, and this is the case which he says explains most of human history, why people actually are really terrible most of the time for this having reached this stage and not really having any idea what they're doing. And you can tell by his sort of trying to shift up and down from perspectives that he's trying to figure out a way to make this intelligible without making it so intelligible that we can think of it as the action of a rational will. But another thing that's interesting is at the beginning of that passage, he implies that even with the elevation to the next stage, where you have the highest maxim governing your will of doing duty for duty's sake, the lower maxim of self-interest would remain in force. So it's kind of like a hierarchy of maxims. Because we still have ends when we're being moral. We need not and cannot, it seems, detach completely from self-interest. And this raises in the background of Fichte's theory, which may in the end not be coherent, this systematic issue of whether one can be willing more than one maxim at one and the same time, more than one end. And this is the, the thesis that I'm going to call multiplicity. It's a thesis that I think is underdeveloped in Fichte's account. And it's the thesis that I said is alluded to in the passage from Melville when he talks about our noble ends on the one hand, but then in our everyday lives we have to go about pursuing things that are more immediately in our self-interest, or we're going to get kind of bored and distracted by this far-off noble interest. So the last thing I want to mention in Fichte is that he does give an account of what goes wrong in cases that we call erring conscience, conscience that makes a mistake. Right? He thinks conscience can't make a mistake. But he admits that there, we use this phrase, erring conscience, and he wants to sort of explain why it is we might think that makes sense, even though it doesn't. Um, he thinks that what generally happens in such cases is that the agent has a failure of will in the process of deliberation. Fichte writes of a failure of moral attentiveness in which we render obscure the voice of conscience. He also considers a number of different cases in which we possess only an indeterminate consciousness of our duty. Or we lose the guiding thread of conscience. He also gives an account of evil as having to do with the original laziness of the human being, which I'm not going to really go into here. What I, I really want to get to is this surprising claim that he makes in quote um, number five, where he ends up saying that evil is, in the end, inexplicable in a certain sense. He says, one should also note that this act of freedom through which this consciousness of the moral law is either clearly retained or else allowed to become obscure is an absolutely primary and therefore inexplicable act. That is to say, it is certainly not by means of any maxim, and hence not with any consciousness of what I am doing, nor of the freedom with which I am doing it, that I obscure within myself the demand of the law. This would be a revolt against the law, the same kind of revolt that was previously shown to be contradictory in the passage number three. This obscuring of consciousness of the moral law is something that simply happens just because it happens absolutely without any higher reason. So you could say that he admits evil and only denies that we can understand the act of freedom that it results from. Because it is not rational, it is not intelligible. In that sense, then, we cannot know what we are doing when we act in a way that is evil. That doesn't mean that we do it unwillingly exactly. There's some kind of act there, but we do it without knowing what we are doing. It's not consciously willed. All right, so that's the background against which Hegel's view of conscience and evil develops. In the phenomenology of spirit and the philosophy of right, I'm confining myself um, in this talk to the philosophy of right mainly because there's so much framing that one has to do with the phenomenology account that it's rather unwieldy. I don't think there's much of a difference between his actual view from 1807 to 1820, um, but it's presented rather differently. And I want to try to quickly, in section two, give you a, a, some background on 
why Hegel, why you might think Hegel is an internalist, and what aspects of his view of the moral will might cause problems for that before getting to his actual account of evil. So just, just to review though, from the first section, um, I identified three systematic issues in his internalism and its relation to evil. One, the inner criterion of duty raises the question of whether I have to be able to isolate the determining grounds of my will, isolation. And also the question of whether others can attribute evil to me given their lack of access to my inner life. Second question, intelligibility is the claim that only actions on maxims are intelligible and that evil action, which would take as its maxim the rejection of the moral law, is unintelligible. This does not mean that we are always good, but it does mean that evil action is inexplicable for Fichte. The will for Fichte can operate with more than one end, it seems, although he's a little bit obscure about this. And thus, there's an underdeveloped thesis that I called multiplicity. This thesis could, in principle, provide a way to accommodate evil within an internalist picture, but in doing so, it would put serious pressure on isolation. For Hegel, these questions are all transformed by a social expressive account of action culminating in an account of ethical life, which I'll get to finally in section five. Yet there is a sense in which Hegel is also quite opposed to the externalist conception of the will as choice. Um, so in this opening section, I want to consider the argument that Hegel does think of free rational action as only action on the good. And I want to say how that's complicated by uh, his views on particularity. So in a recent paper, um, Bob Stern has given a strong internalist account of the Hegelian will according to which it cannot choose evil. He aligns Hegel with the position that Luther took in his debate with Erasmus. So here's the argument I've given on the handout um, number six. <clears throat> the rational will is guided by what is rational to do. What is rational to do is determined by what the agent has the most reason to do. What the agent has most reason to do is settled by the intellect, not the will. Therefore, what is rational to do leaves the will with no room for free choice about what to do. Therefore, the agent who exercises free choice is failing to be a properly rational agent, so not acting freely. Right? So this is a very straightforward presentation of an internalist account of Hegel's view. And in support of this position, Stern cites Hegel's critical remarks on choice in the introduction to the philosophy of right, where Hegel asks the reader uh, not to confuse the freedom that goes with full willing through the intellect with mere choice among competing drives. There has to be a reason for a choice, as we saw above in Fichte. So in choice, and by extension in evil, there is an absence of freedom, an absence of the genuine will. So I think there's a, a Stern's account shares some assumptions with the Fichtean internalist we saw in the last section. Um, but while there's much to be said in favor of Stern's reading and view, it seems to me to be missing something that's fundamental to Hegel's conception of the subjective will that he associates with modernity. Hegel's rational will, which he outlines most clearly in the introduction to the philosophy of right, gains much of its richness and flexibility compared to the Fichtean will through Hegel's innovative understanding of rationality as bearing the three-part structure of the concept. Between abstract universality and acting individuality, he inserts the moment of particularity which specifies the universals. One reading of this particular moment would see it as a moment of choice between options and thus is throwing a wrench in Stern's clean alignment of willing and rational judgment. Hegel's claims in that early passage in the introduction seem to leave this open. As he writes of positing the particular as a moment that is not inferior to the first moment of abstract universality, in fact, in section six, he explicitly contrasts his position with Fichte's by noting that for Fichte, the I equals I is purely positive. And I'll return to this point at the end of section three when we look at what Hegel says about the negativity of the will. But the question of particularity comes into focus in the morality section in the right of particularity. And this is... Um, how Hegel introduces this right. This is quote number seven. 
but the subject as reflected into itself and hence as a particular entity in relation to the particularity of the objective realm has its own particular content in its end and this is the sole and determinant of the action. The fact that this moment of the particularity of the agent is contained and implemented in the action constitutes subjective freedom in its more concrete determination, i.e. the right of the subject to find its satisfaction in the action. Now Stern says that this right has something to do with our perception of the good, so it's not necessarily a counter example to his claim. But what's less clear is that this involves a judgment of the good that stands apart from the conative element that we typically associate with choice. Here, uh, Hegel says, the subject actively commits itself to whatever it is to regard and promote as its end. For human beings wish to act in support of whatever interests them or should interest them as their own. This is less than the full willing on the good but it is clearly the willing of my good as a particular being. And then in the 19, uh, 18, 19, 18, 20 lectures, which are just about to be published in English translation for the first time, there was a version of this that was found in the 80s that Dieter Henrich edited. Then there was another version of these same lecture notes that were found um, 20 years later and then published in, in the German edition, but only now the translation by Alan Brudner is coming out. And um, I don't, one of these passages, this is uh, passage number eight, gives a particularly pointed sense of how particularity can disrupt the internalist picture. He says, the right of particularity is the right to hold important this difference between reflection and acceptance on authority. Everything must be mediated through my insight. Even if my insight cannot confirm it, it can happen that I can say yes to it for reasons of honor. Thus, another form of assent besides insight is our participatory activity. That is to say, when we contribute to what we have to accept, our activity lies nearer to our interest. This is because doing is the translation of the subjective into the objective, and we call the outcome, or at least a part of it, ours. Okay, so the, the stress on activity is supposed to mark the sense in which, in the way we create the content that we affirm. It seems that the particular will determines judgment in these cases, rather than the other way around. And this causes some problems for Stern's view. I tend to think of this as subjective or agent relative value and reasons, both in the ordinary sense of pursuing one's own interest and in the more exalted sense that includes as Hegel lists in 124, love, the romantic, the eternal salvation of the individual, morality, and conscience. These are all grouped under the right of particularity. Now he notes that this particularity is caught in an antithesis with the universal, producing the idea that universalist morality, such as Kant's or Fichte's, has to require that one do with repugnance what duty commands, as Hegel quotes from Schiller. Hegel is worried about the instability of this dualism, and in particular about those who would criticize individuals who accomplish objective ends because they also get subjective satisfaction. That is, he's clearly worried about isolation as a requirement of moral action. Now, sometimes Kant and Fichte appeal to an opposition to nature as a way to achieve this isolation, but Hegel notes that there is nothing degrading about being alive and that we are permitted to take our ends from our natural condition. And this is why in this same section, he criticizes the valet-like moral critic who attempts to show the base nature of those who achieve fame and honor in their actions. Hegel gives a preliminary defense of multiplicity to say that we should not think of subjective and objective ends as necessarily opposed. He holds that we can and do serve both ends simultaneously. But doesn't this put the agent in the untenable position of what Fichte at one point calls making a contract between desire and conscience so that you only do your duty if your desire is also satisfied. And I would say, yes, it does open up that possibility. But it also indicates that Hegel thinks that the moral focus on isolating motives is rather misguided. We judge people according to what they actually accomplish. So he writes, if the series of an individual deeds are of a substantial nature, 
and so also is his inner will. And I take this to be a rejection of the isolation view. Since we cannot know for certain which move motive is primary, it is better to bind, not to bind assessment to inner motive, but rather to the performance. Now with particularity, we might still seem pretty far from the idea of evil, from the thought that we could consciously will evil. But I hope to have established thus far only the idea that there is an activity in the will that is short of full ethical willing and that nonetheless counts as willing. Clearly, we are talking about something that the individual takes to be good, but it is not something that the individual assumes that all others will take to be good. This, at the very least, complicates the internalist picture. And with Hegel's endorsement of simultaneous ends, we are close to the formulation of evil as the preference of the particular over the universal. The sordid sailors and the pillaging crusaders highlight the danger of allowing such an overlap. The papal indulgences didn't exactly help either. We are also seeing that moral assessment is going to have to be rethought if we accept multiplicity and give up on isolation. So in a move that both follows Fichte and stands in tension with his view, in the philosophy of right, the particular moment of the will reappears in contrast to the good as individual conscience. This particularity again arises within a duality and Hegel now associates this particularity with the judgment of individual conscience in the determination of the good in specific situations. This is uh, quote number nine. Because of the abstract character of the good, the other moment of the idea, i.e. particularity in general, falls within subjectivity. Subjectivity in its universality reflected into itself is the absolute inward certainty of itself, is that which posits particularity, and it is the determining and decisive factor, the conscience. While on the surface this bears some resemblance to Fichte's claims about the certainty of conscience, Hegel is very far from endorsing a Fichtean inner criterion for belief in duty. He clearly combines Fichtean reflective judgment in conscience, thus making conscience stand in for practical judgment as a whole. And he is also not concerned in these passages with what Fichte called a clear representation of one's duty. Of course, he thinks that we should try our best to get it right, but he is more concerned to warn us from a situation in which it is impossible to get it right. And he worries that moral or formal conscience puts us in that position. Now Hegel's view of conscience as part of a duality with the universal good is informed by Jacobi's critique of Kantian and Fichtean moral rationalism. I had to put this quote in here, but for reasons of time, I'm not going to read it. Quote number 10 from Jacobi's famous letter to Fichte, a passage that Hegel quotes in Faith and Knowledge, he quotes in his lectures, really an amazing passage. Um, and what Jacobi is saying in this passage is that for Fichte's account to work, ethics and religion have to be reduced to a formal universality that strips them of their living character. So we can see Jacobi is objecting to Fichte's and Kant's understanding of reasons as too impersonal or agent neutral. So agent relative reasons would be closer to what Jacobi is after, allow a role for individuality in determining ethical content. Since Fichte has no problem writing of the goal of morality as the disappearance and annihilation of one's entire individuality, Jacobi's criticism here does seem to stick. All right, section three, the subject's freedom to choose evil. Now, coming back to the idea of a right of particularity and the possible overlap of universal and particular ends, we need to ask whether or not the standpoint of morality has the resources to stabilize a priority of the universal over the particular. Without completely abandoning the authority of conscience, Hegel, at the end of morality, turns to evil as itself endemic to the moral point of view. In doing so, he does some moral philosophy while raising serious questions about the tenability of moral philosophy in the narrow sense. In 139, Hegel endorses a claim about evil that's akin to Kant's claim in the religion, and he seems to go even further insofar as he does not contrast this willing to the idea of acting against duty. 
He seems to state pretty clearly the view that agents are capable of acting freely to be evil. And he thus seems to be an externalist in contrast to Kant and Fichte, at least in contrast to the early Kant. A later Kant is a bit of a question. He writes, this is par uh, quote 11, where all previously valid determinations have vanished and the will is in a state of pure inwardness, the self-consciousness is capable of making into its principle either the universal in and for itself or the arbitrariness of its own particularity, giving the latter precedence over the universal and realizing it through its actions, i.e. it's capable of being evil. Now Hegel has something like a, an incorporation thesis here insofar as he stresses making it into its principle, right? That it's not like you're just taken over by desire. Evil seems to count as action. Realizing one's own particularity through one's actions at the expense of the universal. Hegel preserves a certain guise of the good thesis insofar as he sees the evil as the pursuit of one's own good. He would thus seem to be opposed to the idea that one can will evil for the sake of evil, but he does not take a clear stand here on the diabolical will, I think. Though he says we are evil by nature in this same um, section of the text, what he means is that evil action is possible because one has the consciousness of the good and is in a position to know better even while choosing one's own particularity. He then writes of our inwardness with regard to nature. This is um, quotation 12. Again, just a lot has to do with how we describe evil to try to figure out this question that this paper is about. It has to do exactly with whether it's intelligible and how. But when the will makes these desires, the determination of its content in the determination of contingency, which they have as natural, and hence also by the form which it, the will, has at this point, the form of particularity, it thereby becomes opposed to universality as inner objectivity, i.e. to the good, which, along with the will's internal self-reflection and cognitive consciousness, makes its appearance as the opposite extreme to immediate objectivity, to the merely natural. In this case, the inwardness of the will is evil. Hegel also does not have a problem thinking of this as a free choice for which one is responsible. Passage 13. In connection with this necessity of evil, we should also note that it is subjectivity as the infinity of this reflection which is faced with and present within this opposition. If it stops short at this juncture, i.e. if it is evil, it is consequently present for itself, retains its separate individuality, and is itself this arbitrary will. It is accordingly the individual subject as such which bears the entire responsibility for its own evil. It's hard for me to see how this choice of evil really counts as non-free. And thus it's hard to see how Stern's internalism could be the full story. Now Hegel's language of stopping short could be read as less than a full choice between the options of good and evil. But to say that this does not count as an act of willing seems to say merely that willing is by definition a normative notion, a choosing of the good. One would then have to tell a story about how responsibility requires much less than fully realized freedom. One could argue that the only the good rational will can understand what it is doing and that evil as a choice always remains opaque and inexplicable. Right, that's kind of the position that Fichte and Kant both ended up with in trying to accommodate something like evil. But Hegel seems willing to go much farther, and for good reason, as we're about to find out. On the question of intelligibility, Hegel denies that this turn towards evil is an inexplicable act of freedom. Hegel makes it intelligible in one straightforward way that we've already seen in terms of making one's own particular good um, one's principle as opposed to the universal. But he goes farther than that in thinking of intelligible evil. So recall that the kind of unity that Kant and Fichte associate with self-consciousness and agency is the unity of either pure abstract universality of the I equals I or of the universal form of the law. 
and Hegel founds his entire philosophical method and the notion of speculative philosophy on the denial that one can begin with the purely positive universal in transcendental logic or in ethics. And this is there already in the remark to section six, but it's most clearly expressed in the lecture notes to 139, where Hegel shows how different his view is of intelligibility. This is uh, passage 14. The difficulty about the question of how the will can also be evil usually arises because we think of the will as only having a positive relationship to itself and envisage it as something determinate which exists for itself, i.e. as the good. But the question of the origin of evil signifies more precisely this. How does the negative come into the positive? If we presuppose that at the creation of the world, God is absolutely positive. It is impossible to recognize the negative within this positive, no matter which way we turn. For to assume that evil was permitted by God is to assume on his part a passive relationship, which is unsatisfactory and meaningless. The solution of this problem from the point of view of the concept is contained in the concept itself. For the concept, and again, read rationality here when you see concept, or in more concrete terms, the idea, realized concept, realized rationality, has the essential characteristic of differentiating itself and positing itself negatively. But from the point of view of the concept, positivity is apprehended as activity and self-differentiation. Thus, evil as well as good has its origin in the will, and the will in its concept is both good and evil. Hegel is saying here that evil is endemic to the concept and that far from being unintelligible, it is built into the structure of negativity that is the heart of all intelligibility for him. And he takes it to be a virtue of his account that he has no problem finding a way to explain evil and no need to worry about the question of how the evil enters into the good. There is no pure good in the first place that would then have to be disrupted from another source. And in another version of this talk, I, I cite some passages from the religion section of the phenomenology where he talks about the evil and the absolute essence. So trying to talk about the evil in God as a way of representing this duality that he thinks has to be at the heart of everything. All right, section four, the evil of the abstract good, hypocrisy, and irony. So 139 in the philosophy of right is just the kind of narrow official account of evil. But he then goes on in 140 to give an entire catalog of different versions of evil, many of which can be traced, although he thinks not quite justly, back to Fichte's moral philosophy. He thinks Fichte came up with this very subject-centered view and then a bunch of his followers and romantics and Schlegels and so on took, ran with this and uh, turned it into something that led to immorality and to the um, sorts of assassinations and so on that got people into trouble right before this book was published um, who were basing their view on their conviction that the right thing to do was to kill, in this case, a person who was supposed to be a Russian spy. So that's the backstory to all of this that we can talk about, but uh, that colors the view, the, uh, the nature of this published text, as I'll say in a minute. So morality recognizes the power, the morality in its official version, Kant, Fichte, and this view that Hegel puts out in the middle of his text, recognizes the power of thought over action the very power that for someone like Kant makes it possible to have a self-legislating autonomous will. But for Hegel, as we've just seen, free thought is not simply and solely good, such that we can oppose it to the natural motivations as the source of evil. Hegel was naturally reluctant to put this point in this way in the philosophy of right, where his published discussions in 139 and 140 come across as rather moralistic. It's perverted thought, not thought itself, that's evil. Now these lectures from 19 and 20 tell a slightly different story. It's not like his doctrine is really different, but the way in which he's addressing it is less moralistic, more from the standpoint of speculation that we saw in that last passage in section three. <laughs> 
it's more a story that harkens back to the phenomenology account where the instability of the evil and good at the height of thinking was also thematized. In that pivotal section in the phenomenology at the end of the spirit chapter, the one who accused the agent of evil became subject to the charge of evil, a reversal that led to a recognition that only, but not merely a community of trust could stabilize the good and evil in each of us. What I'll get to in my brief section five at the end. In his treatment of evil um, as willing only the abstract good, right? So he actually starts out talking about how willing the abstract good is itself evil. Hegel, in fact, engages with exactly the question of this essay to say that we should not be led by the formal object of action into thinking that there really is no such thing as evil. In the published text, he's quite sure about the pernicious effects of this doctrine, while, as I say in the lectures, he's more speculative and willing to dwell on the idea of the inseparability of good and evil. He considers the position of those who hold that all action is under the guise of the good, noting that if this is understood to mean that everyone always wills something positive, then we have in effect done away with evil, which would itself be evil. This is uh, quote number 15. But this abstract good being completely lacking in content can be wholly reduced to simply meaning anything positive at all. Furthermore, just as the good is an abstraction, so consequently is the bad likewise devoid of content, receiving its determination from my subjectivity. Right? He's all speaking in the voice of people who hold this view. And this is also the source of the moral end of hating and eradicating the bad as an indeterminate quality. Theft, cowardice, murder, as actions, i.e. as products in general of a subjective will, have the immediate determination of being the satisfaction of such a will, and hence of being something positive. Right? You just will some good, doesn't matter which good, you will something positive if we take it that way. And in that case, the conclusion would be that nobody is really evil. And this is in quote 16, which you should read kind of with the idea of rejecting the diabolical will in, in the background. Thus it has been said that there is in fact no such thing as an evil man, for no one wills evil for the sake of evil, i.e. the purely negative as such, but always something positive, and hence, according to the point of view in question, always something good. In this abstract good, the distinction between good and evil, as well as all actual duties, has vanished. Consequently, merely to will the good and to have a good intention in one's action is more like evil than good, in that the good is willed only in this abstract form so that its determination is left to the arbitrary will of the subject. The point is simply that the internal connection of the will and the good should not be taken to mean that whatever I will is necessarily good. This point seems hardly worth mentioning when stated so baldly. I mean, he's reminding us, in effect, that there are major differences among the goods that we will. What is potentially confusing here is that Hegel's own theory of the will's simultaneous purposes tends to add to the difficulty of knowing what exactly is determining the will. So Hegel addresses the biggest worry with Fichte's ethics and the danger that conscience is too close to evil in picking up the question of acting from one's certain belief. The idea of an inner criterion has the advantage of serving an internalist account of morality, according to which motivation follows from the representation of one's duty. He is far from thinking of one's conviction as arbitrary, but it's not hard to see how the view that Hegel criticizes could come from Fichte's claims about the identification of one's duty being immediate and felt. The point that Hegel brings to the fore is that this view claims incompatibility with error, right? Conscience is infallible in the moment of conviction. But then, after the act, admits that, okay, yeah, maybe error is possible. That, at least, is one way of reading Fichte's claims about what he says we call erring conscience. And this is what he's getting at in uh, section 17, which begins kind of intelligibly and normally and then ends sort of surprisingly. This is from the lectures. Whoever acts not in accordance with objective right, but in accordance with right as he knows it, makes his fancy the highest principle of action. He thereby says that he wants to know what right and duty are, 
from himself against the whole world. And here, error is no matter of indifference. Before he acts, he says that knowledge as I know it is the deciding factor. And afterwards, he says that error is possible here. This is a contradiction. Here is just the innermost and deepest point where good and evil touch. The point where evil originates, the innermost heart of evil. This point is the highest abstraction, the speculative pinnacle. Evil should not be conceived as arising in an accidental way, but rather as occurring and originating eternally. So there's a question about what makes him switch from outright condemnation to conceding that this point gets to the heart of something unavoidable. What should we make of the speculative principle claim? Now in part this goes back to the idea that we saw above that the concept, self-consciousness, is an inward differentiation, an opposition of universal in particular. We, are th we think we tap into the good in reaching back to the original I in Fichte's language, but that original self-consciousness is both pure thinking and nature at once, and there's no guarantee that what emerges will be universal rather than an arbitrary expression of my drives. Okay, so the last two cases uh, in 140 are the evil of hypocrisy and of irony. Hypocrisy is a problem of the inner and outer and their instability in a world in which the subject is viewed as the source of normativity. In a complex ethical landscape, there will be different priorities for different people, so it is not so bizarre to adopt the view that it's hard to make one's actual purposes match the standard of pure duty. Right? So pure duty seems to be the standard that a moral person has to uh, claim for themselves, and the phenomenology account is pretty clear about this. But it's also pretty clear that one's actual purpose in most of one's life is not going to match that standard of purity, which Hegel doesn't really think exists. So hypocrisy is a sort of natural uh, result of that. But he wants in this quote 18 to lay the blame for this on the idea of morality itself. So he says in 18, this idea of hypocrisy gets lost at the moral standpoint. Here what is right and good lies in the inward determination of the good and in the value of action generally. So the assumption that something can be objectively a crime no longer holds. According to this position, there is always something good in what is desired. In recent presentations, we have seen that has been elaborated with great eloquence insofar as the human being acts in accordance with his instinct, he does well. But he's not exactly saying that our purposes should not have any negative content. And as I said, he's quite clear that the purely universal doesn't exist. So the claim seems to be much more um, that going against moral speech than it is against certain particular ways of acting. I mean, I take this not only out of this philosophy of right text, which, as I said, is kind of moralistic, but also out of the phenomenology text. Now, the, the kind of final circle of hell for Hegel is the standpoint of irony. And it's here that he seems to finally come out and just say, I think without much equivocation, that conscious willing of the evil is indeed possible. Although it has a relation to this objectivity, this is passage 19, it at the same time distances itself from it and knows itself as that which wills and resolves in a particular way, but may equally well will and resolve otherwise. In this shape, subjectivity is not only empty of all ethical content in the way of rights, duties, and laws, and is accordingly evil, evil, in fact, of an inherently wholly universal kind. In addition, its form is that of subjective emptiness, in that it knows itself as this emptiness of all content, and in this knowledge knows itself as the absolute. This account seems to put to rest the idea that we cannot be in a position to will evil. So it seems like we pretty clear that we can be in that position. But it is also worth noting that Hegel tends to associate this with his own philosophical point of view and with the beautiful soul who does not act. So he, in, 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 you know, he says this in these very cryptic passages in the phenomenology. And in the lectures, he takes some pains to say that his philosophical position is not the moral position. So there's a little bit of tension here at this very point, at the highest point where we're talking about the consciousness, the self-consciousness that knows itself to be above all content. In a way, that's the position of the philosopher himself. And so he's 
condemning the ironic consciousness here, but also kind of acknowledging in a sense that he has to sort of keep it uh, at bay from his own conception of what self-consciousness is. Now, after this kind of litany of evil subjectivity, one could wonder whether we should turn the question around and ask, is it possible for the moral subject to be good? The rational will seems not only evil by nature, but evil by rational capacities as well. Modern subjective freedom was introduced by Hegel as necessary and good, but by the end of the chapter, it appears mainly to be perverted and bad. As I mentioned above, the view looks a little bit different in the phenomenology where accusations of evil are put in the mouth of a self-righteous judge and rather deflated insofar as the judge's own pretensions to goodness are deflated. In the teleological account of the philosophy of right, the important point is that irony is not itself a stable account of action. Its success or irresistibility as a posture is therefore an argument for the need to move beyond morality to a conception of and setting for action that satisfies the demands of the fully rational will. This move will let us see the truth in Stern's internalist position, but it will raise further problems about the status of modern particularity. Well, I've got a little bit of time, I think, if that's all right. I've got a sh pretty short section five. I'll bring this to a close. Section five, evil and particularity in ethical life. Objective and recognized. <laughs> uh, I should say, for full disclosure, I'm looking at my text, which was printed before the handout, and it says, colon, bourgeois, not tragic. So there's different ways this last section could have gone. I will talk about the bourgeois a little bit, but objective and recognized is my uh, official topic here. So um, let's go back for a moment to evil Ahab and his reflections on the motivations of his crew and the crusaders. Notice back there in passage one, he says manufactured man, meaning man socialized to the practices of this world rather than natural man, who also appears in Moby Dick. The great object is the hunt for the white whale and the recovery of the holy lands from the infidels. We can take these as the political ends. The individual, however, needs his own satisfaction in the form of profit, cash, material rewards. In the case of the crusaders, pickpocketing or looting and pillaging. In the case of the crew, pursuit of their profit in hunting whales for their oil. I return to this dynamic because Hegel's view of ethical life, while noble-minded in many respects, turns at its heart on the satisfaction of the individual, the male individual, in its family and career in civil society. One can read Hegel's suspension of morality, the Aufhebung of morality and ethical life, as a normalization of evil. This might sound extreme, and it might seem that I'm reverting to a, a moralistic posture, but Hear me out. Ethical life is a system of institutions in which individuals have clearly defined duties and rights, grounded in legally sanctioned contexts of action. One has the distinct impression that in this domain, the problem of evil does not even arise, since the will is not in the indeterminate space in which making my particularity paramount against the universal arises. Hegel derives ethical life from moral agency in the sense that ethical life stabilizes the various requirements set out individual, individually in morality and united only in a contradiction in the moral will. A natural way to read the transition would be to say that it finds a way to diffuse the tension that makes evil possible by incorporating particularity and its negativity into ethical life itself. This incorporation gives up on the isolation thesis, embraces multiplicity, and makes intelligibility, the intelligibility of our rational willing, a more complex social and institutional affair. Ethical life overcomes the morality of abstract universals and subjectivity, but we should wonder whether that is a sound strategy for individuals or for the modern social order. So one way to ask this question is, does the overcoming of evil also entail an overcoming of freedom of choice and conscience? Hegel thinks that the freedom of the moral point of view is inferior to the social freedom of ethical life. 
where what we will is known as right. And this, as I said, tends to support Stern's view. This is because he holds that willing in the full sense is willing a rational content, and because in morality there is no fully determinate rational content. One is not fully free. And in large part, this is because the relation of the will to the will of others is not satisfied. I don't want to read uh, quotations 20 and 21, just to say, in 20 he says, we're liberated from, the inter from uh, moral reflections on obligation and desire. So he, he conceives the moral agent as just constantly kind of struggling with their inner life, but why am I really doing this? Would I be doing something else if I wasn't going to be rewarded? So this kind of whole kind of struggle of uh, whether one is really acting on duty or really acting on desire that I've called isolation is something we overcome in moving to this social sphere. In 21, he somewhat alarmingly talks about the disappearance of conscience. And I'm often defending Hegel's view here and saying, well, but conscience does survive in some form. It's just this bad form of it. But there's also a way to read this less charitably to Hegel that says, no, it really just means you're not going to worry about the evil that your institutions are doing. But there's still a difficulty in equating the rational will with action on the good, as we can see in the lecture note accounts of the unavoidability of evil in ethical life. And Hegel gives a deflated account of objective evil in the lectures, and he does so in service of the claim that a person cannot expect to keep their hands clean in this life. This is passage 22. But in the genuinely good, evil also always appears. A human being who has to act in a concrete and fulfilled life must also know how to be evil. In the pursuit of the essential purpose, a host of purposes that could otherwise be valid are neglected. Thus, if the evil is on the one hand a moment of the will, it furthermore also always appears in actuality. So this passage is an acknowledgement of moral conflicts and the stress on a concrete and fulfilled life. And this is not to say that he no longer considers evil as an inner matter at all, but there are indications that he thinks of it um, in an objective manner as that which is excluded by the pursuit of one's essential purposes, but also that once one is involved in this outer, rich, um, ethical life, one's not going to be so hung up on these questions of whether one's motives are evil or are not evil. But this talk in uh, 22 of essential purposes brings us back to the multiplicity issue, which plays a leading role in Hegel's understanding of ethical life. Hegel's emphasis is on agent relative duties and values in ethical life. That's what the institutions are for. You can pursue particularity within universal contexts and so satisfy your universal bestimmung in doing ordinary actions in family and work for cash. This can appear to, to be Hegel's incorporation of evil into ethical life. But the main thing is civil society. In civil society, one has the license to prefer one's self-interest. And I think it's fair to ask, why isn't that just license to be evil at a certain point? Um, look at quote number 23, his description of civil society, which has only grown more prominent since he wrote it. Particularity in itself, on the one hand, indulging itself in all directions as it satisfies needs, contingent arbitrariness, and subjective caprice, destroys itself and its substantial concept in the act of enjoyment. On the other hand, as infinitely agitated and continually dependent on external contingency and arbitrariness, and at the same time limited by the power of universality, the satisfaction of both necessary and contingent needs is itself contingent, in these opposites and their complexity, civil society affords a spectacle of extravagance and misery, as well as of the physical and ethical corruption common to both. He thought that we had resources in the state and religion to reign in subjectivity, but he seems to have been wrong about the state being a match for civil society and about the durability and strength of religious conscience. And just as a last kind of quote on the handout, I have this quote about the rabble, which always has to be mentioned, because in talking about the, ra the rabble, he refers to it as an evil, as an uble, 24. 
Alternatively, their livelihood may be mediated by work, which would increase the volume of production, but it is precisely an overproduction and the lack of proportionate number of consumers who are thems themselves productive that the evil consists, and this is merely exacerbated by the two expedients in question. So at least he's honest about this, but he doesn't seem to give us a very good solution for it. So insofar as, as all of us in the capitalist system contribute to the evils of property and poverty, we have another sense in which we have to will evil and cannot will the good. Hegel's rational will is intelligible by being part of a system of institutions, but that system is both good and evil. This does not mean that justice is impossible, but it does mean that we have to see the overcoming of evil more as a matter of social policy than of a policing of individual dispositions. Thank you.